How do juries deliberate? So last week, we heard how individual jurors arrive at their preferred verdict when hearing the evidence presented at trial. We talked about the sorts of things that influenced them and how they combine information, typically into a story about the events that led to the offence. What happens when they have to discuss their interpretation of the evidence and their preferred verdict with the other jurors? Well, over the next two videos, we're going to talk about how juries deliberate to reach a verdict, whether these deliberations influence individual jurors' views, and the different ways that jury deliberations can unfold, and what sorts of things influence how jurors deliberate. Now, in terms of factors that might influence how a jury deliberates, one of the things that people often think is important is the foreperson. This is the person chosen by the jury to lead the group during discussions and also to be the spokesperson in the courtroom, particularly when the verdict is returned. So, does who the jury selects as a foreperson make a difference to how the jury deliberates? Well, let's start with how the foreperson is selected and what they're typically like. Usually, the foreperson is elected by the jury. One view put forward by the Morris Committee in 1965 is that the foreperson should ideally possess the qualities of a good chairperson, but be no different from the other jurors. Saxon Hastie's 1978 research suggests that the person chosen as the foreperson tends to be male, from a high socioeconomic background, be older, be the person who sits at the head of the jury table, and is the person who often speaks first during deliberations. Curiously though, Ellison and Munro 2010 found in a study with mock jurors that when the person who spoke first was a woman, it was still often the case that a male juror was nominated to be the foreperson. The woman speaking first was often nominating a man to be the foreperson. A common view is that the foreperson is very influential. McCabe and Furr's 1974 research suggests otherwise, however. In that study, the foreperson did not exert a greater influence on the decision compared to the other jurors. In contrast, Devine and colleagues' 2001 review of 45 years of jury research argued that the foreperson has a big influence on the style of deliberations, whether the jury focuses initially on trying to reach a verdict or on systematically evaluating the evidence. As such, it's possible that the foreperson might influence the verdict indirectly through the way in which the jury deliberates. It's also worth noting that the jury foreperson tends to determine who speaks and when, and so can shape the discussion in that way as well. Ellison and Munro's 2010 research and Manzo's 1996 study provide some evidence for this. They are certainly also viewed as being more influential by the other jurors, according to Diamond and Casper's 1992 study. He or she also speaks more often than the average juror. They speak about 25 to 31% of the time during deliberations, according to Ellison and Munro. And consistent with this, Diamond and Casper in 1992 found that the foreperson spoke about 1,770 words in comparison to the average juror's 789 words. Now, much of what they said, however, was uh, designed to help organise the jury rather than express a verdict preference. Okay. So the foreperson possibly doesn't seem to exert a big direct influence on the jury's verdict, but as Devine and colleagues found in a review of jury research, the foreperson is influential in deciding how the jury deliberates. So let's look at how the jury uh, deliberation itself influences or changes jurors' decisions. What are some of the features aside from the influence of the foreperson that might affect how juries deliberate? Let's start with the question of whether deliberation alters jury decisions. Now there's been a general belief uh, which came from Calvin and Zeisel's influential study in 1966, that jurors have already decided a verdict before they retire to deliberate. Thus, the thinking was that deliberations did not have a big impact on jurors' decisions. Now, this doesn't really fit with what we know about the outcomes of deliberations, however. Many juries don't start out with a unanimous agreement before discussing the case. There will be a majority group of jurors who favour one verdict and a smaller minority group who think differently. Now, given that juries are able to reach agreement in the majority of cases, deliberation must exert some influence on jurors' decisions. Hastie and colleagues' 1983 research even showed that the minority of jurors prevailed and were able to change the minds of the majority in 25% of cases. So deliberation is obviously important. And one way of making sense of these two different sets of findings, that jurors decide their verdicts before deliberation on one hand, and that deliberation changes jurors' minds on the other hand, is to distinguish between different types of deliberations. This is a point made by Sandys and Dillahay in 1995. One of the main distinctions identified by Lieberman and Krauss in 2009 is the difference between verdict-driven deliberations and evidence-driven deliberations. 
The work of Devine and colleagues suggests that it is through the four person's preference for one of these two styles of deliberation that the four person can exert an influence on the outcome of the deliberations. Now, verdict deliberations are those types of jury group discussion uh, focused on reaching a unanimous decision or a majority decision if the decision rule for the jury requires only a majority decision. The discussion tends to be less about the evidence and more about discussing the verdict options. Pressure might be applied to any holdout minority jurors uh, to get them to agree with the majority position. A characteristic of this type of deliberation is frequent attempts to take a poll for the verdict, which has a consequence of identifying indi any individual jurors who might disagree with the majority. Now you saw this type of discussion at the start of the jury's deliberation in the Crime 101 drama this week. Evidence-driven deliberations, on the other hand, focus on a more systematic discussion of the evidence that was presented at trial. For these types of deliberations, there will be less of a focus on simply trying to pressure uh, the people into reaching a decision. The emphasis is on evaluating the evidence rather than taking polls in an attempt to reach a verdict. Now, you saw this type of discussion towards the end of the jury's deliberation in the Crime 101 drama this week. A moment ago, I mentioned different types of jury decision rule. The jury decision rule is the required number of jurors uh, needed for agreement for a verdict. In some jurisdictions, all jurors are required to agree uh, to the verdict before it is accepted by the court. This is called a unanimous decision rule. In other jurisdictions, a majority decision will be accepted by the court. Now, the size of the majority will be, that will be accepted depends on the size of the jury. For a 12-person jury, this might be a majority of 10 or 11 out of 12. It can be a little more complicated than this, however. The type of decision rule used can also depend on the offence that the, the defendant is being tried for. For the more serious offences, a unanimous rule might be required. In addition, in some jurisdictions, for even the most serious offences, a majority decision will be accepted if the jury is not able to reach a unanimous decision after a certain period of time has elapsed. So the decision rule can vary by jurisdiction, by the nature of the offence, and also by the time that the jury has been deliberating for. Now, majority decision rules are often favoured because of concerns about hung juries. These are juries that can't agree on a verdict. Now, this actually only happens in a tiny minority of cases. There have also been some concerns expressed about the time taken by juries to deliberate. So, does jury decision rule uh, have any effect on how the jury makes their decision? Nemeth's 1981 research suggests that the majority decision rule is associated with less participation by minority jurors, the majority jurors paying less attention to minority jurors, fewer hung juries, deliberation taking a shorter time, and perhaps problematically, a greater likelihood of conviction and more errors in recalling the evidence. Now, why is this? Well, because the jurors in the majority are not required to convince the dissenting minority about the correctness of the majority position, they can generally ignore the minority jurors. Therefore, they can avoid discussing the evidence in any great detail and just apply social pressure in an attempt to reach a majority of the required size. Okay, so it seems that juries operating under a majority decision rule are prone to making poorer decisions than those working under a unanimous decision rule. When discussing the nature of the majority that will be accepted, I mentioned that juries can come in different sizes. Now in Australia, New Zealand and some other jurisdictions, criminal cases are heard by juries of 12. In the United States of America, following the Supreme Court decision in Williams and Florida in 1970, as few as six jurors can hear a criminal case. Now Thomas and Pollock in 1992 used probability theory to argue that six and 12 person juries are equivalent in terms of how they make their decisions. Researchers have also often used six-person juries in their studies because logistically it's a lot easier to conduct studies on juries of six compared to 12. You need half as many people for a start. Now, unfortunately, the research suggests that juries of six and 12 do not function in the same way. Six-person juries communicate less, are less likely to recall the evidence accurately or examine the evidence thoroughly, and according to Sachs 1977 research, are more likely to reach agreement. That is, they're less likely to hang. They're also less representative of the community and they often return different verdicts and are more likely to convict. These issues were identified by Hans and Vidmar's 1986 research. Now, why is this? Well, one of the main reasons for these differences between juries of six compared to juries of 12 is conformity. Conformity occurs when people yield to real or imagined social pressure. 
Ash's 1955 study was important in highlighting how groups bring about conformity and illuminating the conditions that enhance conformity and those that diminish conformity. So let's look at Ash's paradigm. Ash gave a group of participants who took part in the study as a group a picture of a vertical line followed by a second picture of three vertical lines. Participants were asked in turn which of the three lines matched the length of the original line. In this example, the answer is clearly B. Now, in this study, all of the participants except one were actually working with the experimenter. So they weren't actually real participants. They were what we call confederates. All of the confederates responded before the real participant. And on some trials, the confederates all gave the correct answer, while on others, they gave an obviously incorrect answer. For example, line A in our example. Ash was interested in whether the real participant would go along with the group and why. Ash found that the vast majority of participants, 76% in fact, went along with the group and conformed on at least one trial when the group was giving an obviously incorrect answer. Ash argued that there were two reasons why conformity occurs like this. The first is called normative influence. Here, the real participant maintains his or her private view about what the correct answer is, but conforms in public to avoid ridicule or social censure from the rest of the group. The second is called informational influence. If a person is not sure about what the correct answer is, the group's response helps the real participant to identify what the correct answer might be. Now, interestingly, in some studies, Ash varied whether the group gave a unanimous but incorrect answer or whether there was non-unanimity in the views of the rest of the group. We've seen in our example so far what a unanimous but incorrect answer would look like. The rest of the group chooses the same but incorrect response. Now, what happens, however, if some of the group chooses one incorrect response and the remaining group members choose another incorrect response? What will the real participant do in this situation when there's non-unanimity? Well, Ash's studies show us that uh, when there is non-unanimity in the views of other group members, then the rate of conformity dramatically reduces. It is sufficient if only a single other group member disagrees with the majority. That single dissenter doesn't even have to agree with the real participant's response for conformity to be reduced. The dissenter simply just has to give a different response to the majority. So how does this relate to how juries deliberate and jury size? Well, let's try a thought experiment to illustrate this. Imagine a jury of six and a jury of 12. Now, let's imagine that the rate of dissent in the general population about a particular issue is one in six. If we select people from the general population to form these two juries, one made of six people and one made of 12 people, then we would expect that the rate of dissent to be represented in each jury like this. The six-person jury will statistically have one person who dissents on this issue, and the 12-person jury will have two people who dissent. Asher's studies tell us that the pressure for conformity will be much greater in the six-person jury compared to the 12-person jury because it is much more likely that a dissenter in the six-person jury will be on their own. So the evidence suggests that jury deliberation does influence individual jurors and that 12-person juries working under a unanimous decision rule tend to be more systematic and thorough in their decision making. As such, we've heard that juries with certain characteristics make better decisions, and in the next video, we'll talk about whether juries as groups make better decisions compared to individual jurors.